Welcome back to another episode of Mad in Love. I'm your host, Dr. David Hawkins, and today we have a very special guest. Big smile there, Dr. Jans. Dr. Gregory Jans, founder of the center, A Place of Hope, is not just an acclaimed author. You know, I get to Dr. Jans, I get to say that I've written a lot of books, but you you pace me, man. You uh, over 45 books and counting every time I see the guy and I see him a couple times a year. Typically, he's written another book. Anyway, 45 books, but also a significant voice when it comes to behavioral health. And we met at the American Association of Christian Counselors recently, and we had an insightful conversation, a robust conversation. And we're going to talk more about that today, about social media and its impact, uh, how it impacts our perception of anxiety. And we knew that uh, our listeners, Dr. Jans, would want to hear what you have to say. And I'll throw in my two cents worth. Given our podcast focus on narcissism and emotional abuse, narcissistic and emotional abuse, it seems like a very, very relevant conversation. And let's lead in to talking about how social media informs or, shall we say, misinforms at times or amplifies or exaggerates, distorts our understanding of trauma and anxiety. So let's dive in. Let's hear about, you know, I know about you, but, and, and I, all of our listeners and watchers know about you too, but for those few that don't, tell tell us, who you are and uh, a center, the center and a place of hope. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Dr. Welcome. David, first, it is good, good to be with you. And we have the privilege of being in the same state, not yes. far away. Yes, yes. If I was look out over the waterfront. Yeah, yeah I see, I'll wait. I, I, uh, I can, you know, you're <laughs> yeah. not too far away. Not far as a crow flies, yeah. for sure. So, so good to be with you. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, well, it's 39 years ago we founded the Center of Place of Hope. So we're a, we're a facility where uh, people come and stay, um, and uh, we generally work with individuals. Um, and you are the uh, resident uh, expert in the marriage arena, and uh, we work with individuals, depression, anxiety, uh, times addiction, uh, some of the mm. traumatic uh, issues. Trauma is a big uh, area that uh, our team works with. There's a, about 50, uh, low 50s uh, on staff. So we very That's, much wow. yeah. we believe in, in, in working with the whole person. So we have a medical team. Uh, you know, we're going to want to check you out. We want to do some blood work. We want to see, is there anything physiologically going on that could be interfering or adding to depression or anxiety? So, so this, uh, uh, you know, our country is probably in a mental health, I'm going to say epidemic. It's a little more than a crisis, I think. Yeah. And, uh, individuals are seeking help uh, like never before. And uh, like you, we want to be there. You know, I, say a little bit more about that. I mean, not to go off in too much of a tangent, Dr. Jans, but yeah, mental health has become, we can talk about it again. I mean, you and I have been around for a while and, you know, there was a day when you could talk about it a lot. There's been a day when you couldn't talk about it at all. We're not that far out of some <laughs> times when you couldn't run for public office and have any kind of a depression or anxiety diagnosis and i think it's rebounding and is that true are we now are we is it now becoming okay to call the center and say look i mean you know my meeting once a week with a counselor is not doing it i need some more help is that are, are you finding a little more of a rebound that way that it's okay to talk about mental health sure i think there's times where the intensity gets so great and uh, we start to lean a little bit over to despair and hopelessness and and we realize man i i need something more and and that's what we do we're we're the something more yeah uh, when a person has suffered for a long time and you're right dr david it is uh mental health is being talked about more we take post pandemic i guess we're in post pandemic um mm -hmm. uh, we take Hope. uh the last three years and uh, people have uh, suffered and it was kind of a tipping point 
maybe you already had some depression issues, but the last three years and uh, with all the level of uh, of unrest in, in many areas of our life, uh, that anxiety level uh, increased. And so we really are seeing, uh, and I'm going to say higher acuity, people's needs are greater mm. as well. And so I just really honor um, a person who's, it's a big deal to pick up the phone and say, you yeah. know what, I need help. And those are the people, by the way, those are the people that generally don't regret it. They're generally the people who get the help. Uh, but asking for it is such a big, big deal. But I think there's less shame now. It's, it's so common. that It's like, yeah, um, it's okay now. You know, Dr. Jans, you're, you're implying this, but uh, I, I love I love your phrase that, look, no shame, no shame at all in picking up the phone and calling and saying, look, I, look, I get yeah. it. You're, you're once a week counseling or you're every other week and you're going to church. You're doing you're doing a few of the things needed. But you, I, I love your phrase. You need something more. And no, no shame in that, everyone. No shame. And and. Dr. Jantz, you see that and you say that to people that look good for you. Good. I'm seriously not. I'm not talking as a businessman. I'm talking as a human being. Good for you to have picked up the phone and said what I'm doing isn't making it. So you're seeing a lot of that, right? That people are yeah. reaching out. And I believe right now that the number one diagnosis that we're no, number one non medical diagnosis would be anxiety uh. and the anxiety levels. And we are seeing a lot of uh, what I'm calling anticipatory anxiety. Every day we're on edge and just anticipating what's going to happen, what's going to be in the news tomorrow, what is going on. And so we're always, um, maybe we could say hyper vigilant. We're at a place of um, just high intensity mm. in our anxiousness. And uh, that's not decreased. If anything, it's, it, it's increased, not decreased. So I'm imagining, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, so the average person, Joe and Jenny, whoever they are, and I'm imagining they have anticipatory anxiety. They are stressed out. That's a word we yes. used to use, but we still use that word stressed out. And now the anxiety has a ripple effect. I'd like you to speak to that. Do you see that happening where there's a ripple effect? Now the couple is experiencing anxiety. Now the family is experiencing anxiety. Now the, anyway, is it, does it work like that and everything is amplified? Do, do you, you see know, anxiety that? being a form of fear? And what we see is that, that yeah, yeah. fear, uh, you know, you can go into a room and just kind of absorb that fear. And in families, are, you know, our kids are the sponges. And so if there's a lot of anxiety and fear that that you can kind of feel in the room, yeah, uh, yeah. Our, our kids will absorb that. And so fear does have a ripple effect. It ripples over to other people. When we're around an anxious person, we tend to be a little more anxious ourselves. Um, and as we look at this, hmm. the effects, well, after a while, we want to, um, I call it mood modulate. We want to feel different. I'm so tired of feeling this. It's affecting my sleep. I'm probably isolating away from other people. I may have turned to alcohol. I may be uh, doing escapism behaviors. I Maybe I've stepped into um, pornography, social media. I'm, I'm just looking for a way to feel different. And that's what we're seeing. So addiction rates, you know, addiction rates are, are, are way up. Now, what's that do in a marriage? Well, Ooh. after a while... Um, because we, we tend to isolate, our intimacy goes down um, because we're so anxious um, and anxiety really takes the forefront. And this part of our brain, speaking of the forefront, the prefrontal cortex, yeah, that yeah. part of your brain, uh, that's where we're supposed to make good decisions. But if you're full of fear and anxiety, it's it's hard to make decisions. And you might find that I'm more impulsive or I just don't do anything. and and so. It does have a detrimental effect in relationships, in marriages, uh, over time. You know, Dr. Jans, my goodness, what you just said. So if this person, Joe or Jenny, they are feel, feeling stressed out, 
They are not managing their stress effectively because it's happening day after day after day. Maybe she's overwhelmed. Maybe he's overwhelmed. And now there's an irritability. She's irritable. He's irritable. I, man, this is just a recipe for now she withdraws. He withdraws. He gets into pornography. Now, now, now you know this. Uh, we we learned in graduate school that these methods of coping actually add more problems to the equation. So the pornography doesn't really help. Well, doesn't help at anything. Uh, her withdrawal into social media. Anyway, we're going to talk about social media. But our efforts to cope. Speak to that. Can can efforts to cope actually be adding more burdens? And more more problems to the equation as opposed it's not solving anything, right? Well, it's not. And and you said it well, it does make things worse. We may feel some initial relief. You know, the person that maybe turns to alcohol and go, ah, I feel better. Yeah. <laughs> but then after that, you have something called regret because you don't Oof. feel better. And regret. And you may make mistakes, you turn to alcohol as a daily way to cope. And you realize, oh man, it's taking me farther away from where I really want to go. But but then kind of the addiction grabs you. And that could be said maybe of pornography or um, maybe food addiction. Maybe yeah, it's yeah. food. And so it does affect, I just want to say it affects our, not that we wanted it to, but it does affect yeah. our relationships and our marriage. And uh, that stress has to go somewhere and we have we have our secret affair going on with the alcohol or maybe with food. Um, I've seen people who are even they maybe they're hiding junk food or candy in different places. And that's they're just hiding, d doing the little drug stash. Uh, the person that um, can hardly wait to get home and uh, binge on food who maybe stops at a fast food drive through, but has done it so many times that now we go to different drive throughs because we don't want anybody to recognize us. <laughs> so um, that's how that's how bad it can get. It gets ritualized, you know, so he, she sneaks yeah. off to blank and they hide their blank and they secretly think about their blank. And you, everybody can, everybody, by the way, everybody can fill in the blank with something. And yes. If you've lived past uh, 21 years old, you probably have had a secret affair of some kind with something somewhere. So we all can relate to this if we're all really, really honest. But yeah, it creates more problems. And uh, I, I like how you're saying that. So... <laughs> And then, then social media enters the picture. Well, let's let's segue <laughs> let's segue into social media sure. and uh, tell us, yeah, tell us about that. What 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 is social media doing to us? Okay, well, let's just go back <laughs> during. Let's say during the pandemic, everybody went into social media in higher numbers. Yep, and it in, ended up being because uh, we weren't in person, so we were in social media for our kids uh depending mm. on which state state you were in you probably were doing at home or virtual learning or we called it virtual learning it didn't work so well but uh, <laughs> yeah uh, you were virtual yeah and, but what happened was we had a whole generation of kids that they were already in social media but now they live in social media oh got and, it and kids kids kind of run in herds so uh, you know that everybody joins the herd and that's what happens social media also for adults so the users of and we could you know call out whatever form of social media it is but uh individuals mm -hmm. uh ended up and go well um this is this is their what their it's their escapism it's it's where they're going to get information try to feel a connection or a relationship but after a while, we realized, man, the more time I'm on, the worse I feel. And so, you know, there's been some interesting studies with depression and social media. If I'm already struggling with depression and I turn to social media, I don't feel any better. My symptoms get worse. Why, why well, is that, Dr. Jans? <laughs> well, there's several reasons. One is when you're on social media, you do a lot of comparisons. There's a comparison. I'm looking at this person, you know, and going, Oh man, 
how they look great. <laughs> Whatever. They've got it all together. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, hmm. now with uh, artificial intelligence, we don't know, is this person even real? You know, right? Everything, everything is distorted in social media. Hmm. So important to look at. And then everybody has their opinion and their interpretation. So people also came to a place where they didn't know what to believe or what to trust. So I went to social media to try to figure out well, what's true. So we have comparisons, we have uh, mistrust. I don't know who or what to trust. And uh, social media is convenient. We know that that brain chemical dopamine, mm. uh, same would be true for gaming. Yeah. Um, um, it's, it's, it's designed, it's designed to keep you on. And if you oh, ask, oh. A person, <laughs> Hey, how, how long were you on Instagram last night? Um, no more than an hour. The reality was it was six hours. Exactly. We, we lose track of time. And so, that's, and it's designed to do that. I want to, yes, let's yes. emphasize that. Come on, there, there's somebody out there that is, I mean, it is pulling you in, okay? So comparisons, um, it's not helping mood, it, it, or maybe it temporarily helps mood, but then, but uh, over time, it, it does not. And you do, and you waste a lot of time that later, later you regret. And, um, and we could, we could say social media. We could also say, uh, gaming, uh, uh and online gaming, uh, so often our, our youth and now it's extended into adults, but when they were doing virtual classroom, so many of them were, um, had another device going, you know, you're supposed to be looking at the teacher, right? But you had another device going, uh, maybe it was your phone and you're playing an online game with a lot of the kids in the class. You, you are absolutely clueless what the teacher is trying to do. Um, yeah, yeah. And you're playing online games. And here's because it's with friends. I feel like I'm with friends. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And so that, that happens. Uh, it's where we, we, we have our relationships online. Now, the other factor we have to look at is I may post something and people are looking how many how many views did i get yeah. how many oh, yeah. how many how many likes did i get and you go i can't believe it i only got what i only got 2 likes and and the other person you're looking at has 500 likes and it's like what and so you t you start to internalize your value based upon likes or comments so yeah so does all of this stuff do these patterns, do they increase anxiety then? Back to the topic of anxiety and trauma. What is the impact of social media on individuals saying that they have this kind of trauma, this kind of anxiety, and they're looking at social media to give me feedback on, I must be this, I must have that, I must, it, 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 I'm assuming, Dr. Jans, that we get distorted information, that it, it's, it's a little yes. bit like uh, walking in a room full of a bunch of mirrors, you know, that, that kind of haunted house. I guess it's appropriate to say that word. You know, you walk through a haunted house and you have all these different mirrors and you're going like, ah, is that yeah. a, a little bit of uh, the way it is? It does distort reality. And that is important to look at. Uh, we do know that, um, people turn to social media to get validated. And, you mm. know, I had this experience recently uh, with um, one of my sons and he, he was, we were talking about social media and he goes, dad, I have so many friends. I go, okay. Oh, um, have you seen any of these friends? No, I haven't seen them, but they're my friends. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Um, so we kind mm. of find even what it means to be a friend. A friend is I have all these people online that they feel like a friend. You, you didn't develop any normal stages of relationship to make a friend. They're instant friends and you call them friends. Well, most of them probably really aren't friends, but we turn to them for validation. I must be okay. I have 500 friends. 500 friends. 
It's a so, great it's a great question, Dr. Jans. The question being then with your son or with any of us, if we we look to social media for validation, I'm kind of thinking this through and we say to ourselves, OK, I've got 500 friends, but you just said a, a, a pretty interesting thing. They haven't really gone through the stages of developing friendship. Yeah. And I'm I'm going to take it even one step further. You know, my friends, the people that are important to me are people I can and do call. And they say I had a friend this morning. True story. Won't mention names, but this friend called me up and or he texted me actually and said, please pray for me. And I did. And I will. Yeah. And I am. And I'm meeting this friend for dinner at five o'clock tonight. And I will ask this friend, how did it go? You asked me for prayer, and I, I want to ask you how, anyway, so these levels of connection, but you, yep. what you're defining with people saying they're my friend, uh, I mean, it's a different definition. I, I maybe feel like I'm surrounded by 500 people, but I mean, would I call them tonight when I'm feeling discouraged? Right. And and no. you've described a really good use of social media because well, there are true friends, somebody I really do know, and we reached out, we connected, and in your case, you're going to have a real life in person yep. Uh, yep. Back later, and that yep. that that's a great use of of social media. Um, so we can use it for good connections. So often uh, it gets used for inappropriate connections and we feel mm. you may connect with somebody online and you may feel, oh, they understand me. And you may feel a false intimacy, a false closeness. And then you start to maybe even have um, thoughts that are, are really not healthy and you start to engage in an emotional affair. And you get a little bit fixated on this person that, you know, is nowhere close physically to you. And you develop you develop out of your own need an attraction to them, but don't know anything about them. So and and that keep going. And then that leads to trouble. It could lead to all kinds of trouble. So now I'm emotionally intimate and I. Let's say I'm married, I have a spouse, but I'm I'm getting emotional needs met online with somebody else. So it's an intimacy robber. And remember, mm. that's a false intimacy. You think, oh, mm. yeah, I know this person really well. <laughs> no, you really don't. So it, you're, you're not telling yourself the truth. You, But it feels it feels so good. If, if you have uh, to be liked and to feel like, oh, they they accept me. I think that I think they love me. You see, our thoughts just really go off. So they. Ju yeah. So you're, you're describing a person that's jumped through the stages. Oh, you like me. I like you. Oh, you love me. I love you. Oh, <laughs> we're connected. Yes, we are. Oh, this is fantastic. Yes. It oh, yeah. wait a minute. And then it falls apart because it's not real yeah is that is that accurate that's very accurate absolutely and so mm. Mm. um then we may make mistakes that we really really later regret there are times where it turns quite sexualized um there could be mm. inappropriate sexualized pictures things start to get exchanged and the intensity of this goes way up and it will lead to regret it's going to lead to betrayal for somebody it's going to lead to a lot of pain and it's never ever what you thought it was how dr jance how does that happen i mean i there there's I'm I'm imagine I'm human. You're human. We're all human. I I mean I can imagine getting swept up in that. You know they like me. They they really like me. They really and I've got a hole in my soul, and they're filling up this yeah. hole in my soul. 
or at least it sure seems like it. You're smiling at me. I like you. You like me. Man, I haven't been getting along with my mate, and I have felt abandoned by my friends, and you like me. This is, I could, give me more of this drug. Yep. And that's what happens. And so, and that's one of the dangers. So if I'm looking to have emotional needs met through social media, it's going to be a setup and it's going to be a setup for heartache. And this is uh, affairs can develop. Um, Mm. And I'd have to say, I call them accidental because most of the time a person's not actively looking for it, but they fall into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of that perfect storm. Yeah. Now, Let's... All, this, all this to say, there is good. Um, there is good in social media as well. I should say. I'm, I'm, I'm going to confess. I'm on social media. Okay. No. And I know. I know. <laughs> but I had. No. I really have to work to have um, time boundaries and what do we allow and um, that. There's some things you really have to decide ahead of time and see if you can really practice it and how successful are you really? How much time does social media really take? How helpful is it? Now, I'm going to, if you want to get personal, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But I'm curious when you say, you know, I'm going to have boundaries. I mean, we, we, we don't do real well at setting up our own boundaries. Do you... Are you accountable to your wife or do you recommend for Joe and Jenny? Do you recommend some kind of accountability? Because, you know, left to our own devices, you ask me how much time did I spend gaming? I'm, uh, yeah, 20 minutes, I'm sure. 20 minutes is all. And it was an hour and a half. Or, right. you know, did I go on Insta? I don't think I went on Insta. No, I did. I did three times. And anyway, so speak to the word accountability. Do you believe in that? And if you do, I'm be very curious what that might look like. Accountability is likely important for most of us. And what I say that is because if I'm willing to be accountable, then I'm, I'm, I'm not hiding anything. It's no, it's not a big deal. Uh, and I, yeah. and I want to be helped. Now there are times where, um, a person, no, I've got this, uh, no. And, and they want to keep it overly private. Well, that would be a concern to me. I, if I am in a, mm. a, a close, honest relationship, well, accountability is fine. You know, it's kind of like, and I have to, honestly, I, I don't mind. In fact, I, I will hand my wife my phone and, and I will, you know, show her something. I don't, I don't care. I don't, I, cause I, I know I'm yeah. not involved per, personally. I know I'm not involved in anything that I shouldn't be. And so I don't care here. You can take my phone. It doesn't matter. Um, so, and, and that should be a standard for folks. Yeah. I, yeah. Every, every, by the way, I just want to highlight what you just said, Dr. Jantz. You should be able to say to your mate, I'd like to see your phone or here. I, I want you to show you my phone. I'm, I, 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 I've got no energy around this. You, please look at my schedule. Please look at my, the amount of time that I'm viewing this and that. Let's please talk about it. I, I've got no, this, I'm not going to get jacked up about anything here. And I think you would say this, Dr. Jans, if I do get jacked up, if I do get like, wait a minute, no, you shouldn't, that, that in and of itself is a red flag. It Fair sure, enough? sure could be. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? It's really refreshing because, okay, if anybody forgets their phone, it's my wife. And so if we're going, no, somewhere, my, my I, wife forgot, could... I forgot my phone. <laughs> and so I will hand her mine and she will she needs to text somebody and she'll just say, you know, this is LaFon on Greg's phone, you know, and I don't mind. It's okay. Right. No big deal. <laughs> so not um, so that we want to be that transparent where we know we don't have anything to hide. Now there has to be trust mm-hmm. and we have to be trustworthy. We have to be willing to be accountable and we have to be willing to receive feedback. Um, Mm. Yeah. Um, You know, Instagram can be a little bit troublesome sometimes. Okay. um, Tell us. 
uh, images. It's image based mm. and uh, uh, photos that really are, I don't know, beyond borderline. And, and so we've really worked to, to do the best you can to keep, uh, keep things scrubbed. Um, mm. and, uh, I do remember it's been a little while, but I remember, um, getting an image and going, Hey, uh, Hey LaFont, I got this. And I don't even know how I got this. <laughs> Just want to, uh, I know. don't want this. And I want I you to know I, I got it. And I didn't ask for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, but having that um, transparency, that freedom where you can just talk about it. Yeah. 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 Let's go back, uh, Dr. Jantz, to the topic of, of trauma and anxiety. Yeah. And I want to weave in. I want to weave in, you know, where where we focus on is the topic of emotional abuse and yes. narcissism. Those are huge buzzwords these days. Tell, tell us what you are seeing in regards to all of that and social media. What do you think, what's the impact of uh, social media on narcissism and the topics of emotional abuse? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, you're just the best on narcissism and, and the whole emotional abuse. And I'll just tell you what my observation is. Yeah. Uh, for a person that tends to be on the narcissistic uh, <laughs> continuum somewhere, um, it's the it's perfect for them. Oh. Um, uh, social media, my goodness, it's powerful. You can appear to control a lot. And it is, you can make yourself the star and... Oh, be boy. anything anything you want so it has all the perfect ingredients and then we also if, mm. uh, if we're an emotional abuser oh my goodness we can be an expert in cyber bully and emotional oh, abuse goodness. online because we feel we feel more powerful online and we may say and do things online that we may not do in person <laughs> Boy, that is just so true. So true. I can, uh, anybody that has any propensity towards egotism and self aggrandizement, big words for people that are, that are narcissistic, social media is going to just amplify that stuff. And, uh, you're, you're going to, you're going to feel bigger than you are better than you are. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, you're going to feel more um, grandiose than what you are. It's going to inflate your ego artificially. And, mm. uh, you know, there are people online that it's given them a sense of power. And there are, I have to tell you, there's mm. horrible things online. How often do we see something that came up in the news was somebody got caught with something? Um uh, when there's the only fans, uh, site and, uh, mm, you right. find out what, what the school teacher was doing that. What? Mm, you know? mm. And so there's a lot of unpleasant surprises sometimes. So we really have to decide, um, what are we going to allow in? And, uh, uh, it's a road of regret. So, um, but remember, there are people online that are not healthy. There are people online that um, would like to exert power and control. They have different agendas. So it's if, if you're an emotional abuser, I can be a big bully online, right? And very little repercussions of that. One of my theories, Dr. Jantz, one, I, I've, I've do, I do different videos and do some talking yeah. and thinking about, you know, what, what is narcissism exactly? I don't want to go off on all of that, but one aspect of emotional abuse and narcissism is emotional immaturity, profound yeah. emotional immaturity. And the partners of narcissistic people say to me, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a child. I'm married to a yes. child. They, they have temper tantrums. They just act the way they want to act. They're bullies. They're just, I, I mean, they're, 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 they're a little child. I am wondering about social media and I'm wondering, I, I, my guess is that social media allows 
people to be just like ick, like disrespectful, overbearing, irritable, opinionated. Is, is that all exaggerated on my part to say that? Or do you think there's some of that or a lot of that that exists? I think there's a lot of that that exists. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, so we, we all need to grow up, but I don't know that social media challenges anybody to, wait a minute, not, you, you, you can't talk like that here. You can't act like that here. You can't, come on, we're, we're self-respecting. I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm imagining that, no, you get to act any old way you want to act, be any old way you want to be. But I, I don't know. Do you agree with that, or do, am I? Do I have a little bit of a distorted uh, perspective on well, all I that? Think, unfortunately, social media in the hands of a person that is emotionally unhealthy can be very destructive and very hurtful to others. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of narcissistic behavior, emotional abuse online, you know what it feels like. Um, there are those that have learned how to be a specialist in ghosting. And, you know, they can, you think you have a relationship with them and then they just disappear and you feel betrayal, you feel hurt, you feel anger. And, and they've put themselves in a very powerful position to come and go as they would like, you know. And so we're not learning healthy problem solving skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, like. We have a whole generation of kids that don't know how to resolve conflict. If I don't like you or, or you said something I don't like, my goodness, all I have to do is click you. I don't have to. I'm not going to deal with you. Bye. <laughs> Dr. Jantz, say <laughs> some more about this. This is really, really important. This is this is scratching the itch that I have of I, I'm, I think about this. <clears throat> You know, if if I'm right, and I don't know that I am, but if I'm correct, that a big part of narcissism and emotional abuse is profound emotional immaturity. And what you just described, so effective problem solving skills, yeah. that is one of the tools as we grow up, we learn how to hang in there with someone. We learn how to take someone aside and say, hey, I've got a problem with you. I'd like to share my feelings with you in a healthy way. Can we sit down over coffee and talk things out and work it out? You're important to me and I want to maintain a relationship with you, but, but I'm kind of annoyed or I've got my feelings hurt or I, something happened and there's a rift between us. I'm really tempted to, <laughs> to click off on Dr. Jantz, but yeah. no, he's important to me. So speak to this. Yeah. And we don't know how to manage our emotions and we don't understand how to how do i share how i feel without being self or destructive to another person so those basic problem solving skills how do i confront an issue and stay in relationship so those are missing and um yeah i i had that um uh, with a uh, with one of my sons and recently you know it's like oh he didn't respond to a text it's been two days um, and so I, I talked to him in person. No. So what's going on? <laughs> okay. Well, it was too stressful, Dad. That's why I didn't respond. What? <laughs> okay. So I'm just saying, I'm giving a personal example because we all have situations we like do. this. We <laughs> do. So um, where um, they're learning to ignore issues or anything that's interpreted as too stressful. Bye. <laughs> so, right. So we just need to remember, um, there's a lot of emotional immaturity and kids are online 10, 11, 12 years old. And, uh, what are they learning about how to be emotionally healthy? Well, <sighs> they're not let, learning. Let's go. Let's segue to that. Dr. Jans. Let's talk about, so yeah. How, all right. So we're agreeing that narcissism and emotional abuse and anxiety, lots of these problems stem from a lack of emotional maturity, a lack of um, an ability to problem solve. Uh, yeah. We haven't used this word, but I think you would agree with this word, developing good judgment. 
you know, the ability to have perspective and go like, oh, that is a person I probably don't want to befriend. That is a person I probably do want to befriend. That is a group that I probably don't want to join. That is a group that I probably do. Anyway, good judgment. So speak to how do parents and how do we all, how, how do we navigate social media so that it, 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 it is the tool that you talked about a few minutes ago and not a trap or something that amplifies my bad behavior? How do we navigate it? And how do we, well, how do we coach parents to navigate it with their children? Yeah. I think we need to teach um, about how to how do I deal with anger and frustrations, mm. uh, so um, so that I because we're all going to have that. So anger, I, I divide it into maybe three three deadly emotions. Anger, uh, part of anger could be hurt. Uh, let's say our next emotion could be fear. How am mm. I going to deal with anxiety in my life? How am I going to deal with worry? So fear. And the third one is guilt or maybe a false guilt, shame. So mm. you can get really um, shamed online as well as in person. But how do I deal with things that really strike at the core of me and I feel I feel something's really wrong with me? So you think growing up, did you have a good emotional, healthy emotional mentor? <laughs> was there somebody? It's like most mm. of us go, wow. Who did I have that was a good role model for what was healthy emotion? Yeah, well, uh, let me uh, let me get back to you on that one. It's yeah, and and that would be true for us all. So, uh, how do we we want to begin to teach our kids uh, what is emotional health? What's that look like? How do I become resilient when I've had a tough time? Um, if I'm feeling depressed, how do I make better decisions, mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. So those are things that I think we're talking about more, but uh, there is really a need for education on what is emotionally healthy. I like what you said about emotional immaturity. Here's emotional health. Here's what immaturity is. Here's the difference. Um, you know, we're not learning it in school, no. right? No, so no, no, no. All right. No. So... So what would you say to parents? I want to ask that question. Let's zero in on, on parents with kids. Would you, would you say that parents need to be monitoring their children with the social media for sure? I'm, I'm watching my sons. You, you, I've, I've got young adult sons, and I'm really impressed with my, my, my two sons and their families. They're really monitoring. They're, they're yeah. watching their kids very closely. And, you know, at what age do they get their own iPhones? And I mean, I don't know that I'm agreeing with all of their choices, but boy, they are watching. They're involved and, um, and their children are turning out quite well at this point. Would you say that monitoring and accountability and just navigating that is going to be critical? Absolutely. And one of the things that we need to look at is um, it's age dependent somewhat, but every kid is different. There is developmental times and developmental ages that we need to be aware of. Now, we also need to know that um, kids are exposed to pornography around age nine on the internet. And so um, we have to talk about it. Shocked. Uh, yep. Um, you think about age nine, it might be dropping to younger ages because the accessibility to pornography is, well, it's it's instant and kids are engaging in pornography at very young ages. So those are things we have to talk about. Um, but we want to talk mm. to our kids about uh, online without shaming them or making them feel bad. That. Yep. We always want to be able to talk about it. Um, just one quick example. When my kids were younger, we had um, a rule. There was no devices allowed at the dinner table. Sure. Okay. Makes sense. But one evening a week, Thursday evenings, and it was hilarious. It was called digital dinner. <laughs> um, oh, my um, goodness. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if it was my wife's favorite time of dinner of the week, <laughs> but um, it was uh, the one time a week that they could bring their device to the table and 
and part of the goal was to show me, hey, what's cool? What's the new app? Yeah, what's okay. going on out there? Show me your world. Yeah. And I, I did that on purpose to learn. Brilliant. What is their world? And always keeping an open invitation. But I could ask things about um, what Why is that? kids yeah. are using. What are you, and and they always want to show mom and dad, but sometimes, you know, we, we don't want to see it. Um, so we just kept it an open discussion. Now, I think I made mistakes by allowing uh, technology too young and, and too accessible. I would change mm. some of the things. Uh, some of the things were, were new and, and I was learning. And but what I know now, I would do some things differently. <laughs> I, I still think it's a brilliant idea and it shows a delineation or a definition of, you know, we don't allow it these six days and, but we do this day. And I, I, I like the definition. I like the, you know, look, let's it, not Thursday, no devices. At the, no, come, come on. We've never had devices on Tuesday, son. No, I mean, no. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Because kids go, Dad, I really want to show you something. Oh, it's we, yeah. It's, we're gonna we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, and not that Thursday, not till Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> but we want them. We want them to know that we're interested in their world. It also could be a potential warning. Oh, what are we seeing? Yeah. Um, and so we just need to open up our eyes as parents and stay engaged. Stay Love engaged. It. Love it. All right. Uh, my goodness, Dr. Jans, you, I'm not surprised we could go on and on. I, I, I love the way you think. I love what I love what you represent at the center, a place Thank of you. hope. I mean, my goodness. And I want to just put it out to everybody. It again, it, the, 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 I speak from my heart here. It's no shame to reach out and say I'm I'm treading water. I yeah. am treading water and I need, I need a life raft. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really, and to be honest with yourself about that, come on, everybody. We're mm -hmm. <laughs> life. Life is a, a famous book started with life is difficult. Life right. is difficult. Let's not make any bones about that. All right. Anyway, Dr. Jantz, your insights have helped shed light on the intricate relationship between <laughs> social media, trauma, anxiety, and Man, we're all we're all trying to face it. And a big thank you for joining us today. Uh, be sure to check out his plethora of resources and his many, many, many books and uh, the Hope and Possibility podcast for more insights. Listeners, if any of this resonates with you, you can always start by visiting our website, www.marriagerecoverycenter.com to book a free 20 minute phone consultation with one of our trained client care specialists to learn uh, how to get started on getting help. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to leave us a five star review and subscribe to our channel to be notified of upcoming episodes. Until next time, I'm Dr. David Hawkins signing off for Mad in Love. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jantz. Good to be with you.